Okay, all right, so good afternoon or whatever the date is where you are. Um, welcome to this talk. Um, the goal of this talk is to give you a bit of under the hood introduction to the OCA code quality and testing infrastructure. There have been a couple of the great talk uh, about how to contribute and uh, how to use this infrastructure. So what I'd like to do now is try to, to show you uh, a bit how, how it is implemented. And OCA is, is quite vast. It's a, it's a big, uh, big community. <clears throat> there are, this is the, the, the graph we, we make with the number of modules. So you see there are 1700 modules on V12 alone. And on PyPI, we have like 8,000 uh, packages. I think we are the biggest uh, contributor to PyPI uh, in terms of number of packages. Um, so OCA is vast and like 200 repository, hundreds of contributors and thousands of modules. And that scale creates very, very specific problems uh, to solve um, in terms of infrastructure because um, you find a lot of existing infrastructure uh, which you can use in open source project, but they are all geared to managing single projects um, with uh, a few a few or many contributors, but generally single projects. And here we have actually 200 repositories that 200 projects on GitHubs and each of them contains, of course, many add-ons. So, and in many cases, we can see each add-on as a small project. So we have very specific challenges to, to, to respond to, to implement this infrastructure. So the goal is to, to support the contribution process. Uh, to make it as smooth as possible for, for contributors and, and reviewers. Um, and we want to ensure a baseline quality level with uh, automated checks wherever we can. Uh, quality is the hallmark of OCA, so uh, it is, it's in part because we've implemented those processes and infrastructure. <clears throat> so we, make to, to, we want to make the contribution process as easy as possible and also help ensuring consistency across all those 200 repos. Another goal of this infrastructure is promote visibility because it's uh, also used to publish uh, and make visible those modules that are created by the community. And part of this uh, visibility, the one goal is to make the, these add-ons uh, easy to discover, but also easy to install for very diverse user populations. It goes from the small user who wants just to download one module and install it uh, to integrators uh, building very large projects, including OCA modules. <clears throat> and all that is done uh, by voluntary work. We have uh, no dedicated funding, funding the work of uh, this on this infrastructure. So we absolutely need to, to keep the complexity under control uh, so it remains manageable uh, in the long run. And this diagram, which I, I will go through uh, during this talk, uh, illustrates uh, all the moving parts uh, we have. And we'll take them down, down one by one. Uh, so I'm going to explain uh, all, all it's, uh, what's there. You recognize some you know, you, you see Travis, uh, you see the run bot, uh, you see our GitHub bot. Uh, the Odoo OCA instance uh, also take place in that. We have WebLate and we, we publish the add-ons also on the App Store, on OCA and uh, to, to PyPI. Um, so the different parts I, I want to go through today are uh, the linting. I wanted to, to explain in a little, little bit more detail how linting was done in the past and how it is done today in, in recent branches. Explain uh, how testing is done in, in Travis. Um, say a few words of, about how the OCA, what the OCA GitHub bot does and how it does it. I explain how the translation platform work, um, publishing, uh, talking about how we publish and where we publish the modules, and also how the, the teams and uh, CLA are, are managed. 
Uh, one thing we, we can try, uh, Simone, uh, I don't know, is the host. Uh, maybe yes. We can, we can do a short question and answer after each part. Uh, if if uh, if that's possible, so don't yep. hesitate to ask question uh, on each topic as I go through them, and maybe we can answer them uh, one by one, since we have uh, like one one hour that that should be that should be feasible. So let's uh, go on with linting. Uh, so linting is the the process of inserting basic uh, code quality and catching uh, common errors. And it is mostly based on static uh, code analysis. So it is a relatively lightweight process. Um, linting, under linting, uh, I also include the activity of automatic formatting, uh, which we now apply in, in branches 13 and, and 14, uh, which we apply to Python, XML, and JavaScript code. Um, we do this automatic formatting uh, in an opinionated way. Well, we did, didn't decide that much in OCA. Basically, we, we use what the tools on the market provide it. Uh, but the main, the main goal is that the formatting is the same everywhere. So reviewers and, and contributors don't have to, to, to have opinion on that. They just do what the, the tools does. It's not perfect everywhere, but uh, all in all, um, we, we notice that we, we win a lot of time and with much less discussion on, on not very important stuff uh, of code, code formatting. So, so contributors and reviewers can really concentrate on, on the important stuff. And this, this process also does some automatic correction of uh, boring stuff like like endings, is correcting mixed uh, line endings and of files and, and, and things like that. Um, in the past, uh, so for, for branches before uh, and up to 12, we had um, uh, basically two, two linters. Uh, one was Flake 8 and the other was, was PyLint with the excellent PyLint Odoo modules from Moises Lopez. Um, they, they were and still are located in the Metena Quality Tool repo, uh, at least the script that triggers them. And it served us uh, very well over many years. Uh, and the big advantage is that, that that was easy to update in central place for all repo. But the big difficulty too was it was harder to keep compatible across all of the versions. And it uh, frequently happened that upgrading the linter did break existing branches that were uh, green previously for, for no very good reason. And so the, that that's uh, the, the effect of um, making old repos uh, read faster than they, they needed to. And another drawback of, of that approach is that it was complex to configure and, and, and run locally. Uh, you had to, to discover the configuration and install, install the linters yourself. And it was also not that easy to, to integrate in uh, your development environment for, for the same reason. And since uh, branch 13 and, and the code sprints last year in, in Belgium, uh, we have started using pre-commit. So pre-commit is an off-the-shelf tool. It's written in Python, but it, it supports uh, hooks, as they are called in, in different languages. So it, it's not specific to the Python nor, nor uh, OCA ecosystem. And the advantage is that there are many off-the-shelf linter available, so we could uh, very easily expand the reach of the linting we were doing. And the few other advantages is that uh, the local configuration each, each repository is easily discoverable. Uh, the, the configuration files, you, you find it in a dot file at the root of the repository, and, and there's nothing else to, to configure. So it's uh, easy to run locally uh, and to integrate it in your development environment. And it's also very easy uh, using pre-commit to run the exact same checks and formatting that is going to run on the OCA uh, CI infrastructure uh, in, in Travis. And now since a few months, uh, it's managed centrally with a copier template. We, so we have a, a, a new repository, I've put the link here, uh, from which we can script the, the deployment very easily to, to all repo. And that's a contribution from Jero Lopez. Um, 
which is a, a very, very useful one and will really help us to, to push uh, updates to the, the template to existing branches when, when we need to. That said, we'll try to do as less updates as possible uh, and updates should be only to fix bugs or really add new features. But when we start a branch with a specific uh, linter or formatter configuration, the plan is to stick to it. Uh, at least for for the, 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 the for forever on that branch, um, and even probably for future branches to avoid different formats across version that makes uh, uh, porting more more difficult. So the way it is configured is that you see there is a pre-commit config.yaml at the root of each repo. And in that file, we define what are called pre-commit hooks and that different checks or formattings, formatters that are going to run on, on, on the code. And on top of that, you have the individual linter configuration in each repo, like Flake 8, PyLintRC, ESLintRC, and so on, uh, for which we have tried to use the, the default uh, configuration file name. So if your development environment support it, it should pick it up. Uh, pretty automatically for, for many of them. Um, the important part is that those files are generated. So in case of urgency, you can modify them locally in, in the repository to fix pressing issues. But really those issues should be reported in the template repository. So we can discuss them, find the consensus, and then apply them to, to our repository. You also need to be aware that if you change those files locally, it will make it difficult for your repository to, to receive updates uh, uh, after that, because there might be much conflict. Although Copier is capable of preserving local change to, to some extent, as always, if there are conflicts, uh, they will be, need to be handled manually. And so here I show an example of um, the linter configuration where you have the black uh, Python code formatter. So basically all configs are, are the same. You give the a GitHub repository name and that's the place if you want to know more of, about a, a specific linter is that the place to look for documentation. And then we give a revision. It's important to, that is, it is pinned. So we never put a branch name like master or something. It's always a tag or uh, a commit to be sure that everyone is going to be on the same page and use exactly the same version as the linter. So that means that if you run locally, you will get exactly the same result as when it is run on, on Travis. And then the, the hook name, uh, because in some cases there are several hooks in the same, in the same repository. So one big benefit is the capacity to run locally. So it's very easy. Um, you can install uh, pre-commit locally with pip install minus user, or if you use pipx, uh, pipx install pre-commit. Then you get an, uh, an executable file, uh, which is pre-commit, uh, oh, there is a typo here, pre-commit space run underscore underscore all is going to run a uh, pre-commit uh, and so do all the checks and all the formatters on all files of your local copy of the repository. After that, if there are, you, you need to interpret errors, there might be failing checks or if uh, the formatters like black or the XML formatters or the JavaScript formatters have updated files, you need to look at the, the diff, don't worry too much and commit them and push them uh, and you will you will get the green build uh, on, on, on Travis. Um, before running pre-commit run, uh, it's always recommended to, to at least um, uh, add your change to, to your local uh, index so you see the diff that, that has been done, but it, it's not uh, necessary if you are, not, you are ready to accept blindly what's going to be done, just run pre-commit run uh, minus A and, and that's it. Another thing you can do is that you can run pre-commit before push. So you type pre-commit install at the repo root and uh, every time you create a commit, it will run uh, the checks for you. 
And how it is integrated, so beside the, the copy using the copier templates, basically it's very simple, pre-commit receive uh, push and, and pull request events from, from GitHub. And that's one of the job that Travis is running. And so um, you, you see in the Travis log uh, the, the result. So those who passed, well, don't worry, those that are marked failed, uh, either you need to, to look at the change that have been done. And in that case, uh, you get a diff at the end of, uh, of the job. So when that happens, that means that you need to rerun locally and commit. Uh, and you get nice instruction to, to do that. And alternatively, there are sometimes failing checks and those you need to, to fix them manually locally and then uh, start again. But really, to save Travis time, uh, there is no reason to get a red build on pre-commit. So run it locally before pushing. It's a good habit uh, to take. So that's it for linting. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions about that topic. Nope. The chat is silent. Silent. So that, that was the easy one. So <laughs> I think it uh, start to be fairly understood uh, in the community. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. No. Oh, the the chat seems silent. So you can go ahead. I think. Okay. I continue. Um, so. Testing. Um, here, I want to say a few words about a uh, new, new feature being uh, developed. Uh, so for testing with basically Travis, who is going to, to run uh, beside the LinkedIn, is uh, going to run the test, the actual uh, unit test of, of the modules. And then we have, uh, we have RunBot. So basically, both of them are listening to GitHub events. Uh, Runbot is going to, to, to do the build, and I come back to it. And uh, Travis is going to uh, basically install the repo and its dependencies and then uh, run the test. Um, the, the biggest part of the, the Travis configuration sits in the maintainer quality tools repository. So that's the place where you need to look if you need to understand in details what's uh, happening there, or if you're interested to, to contribute. And there are two important scripts in that process. The first is called Travis install nightly. And the second is called Travis uh, run test. So as the name implied, the first is going to do the installation part. Uh, getting all the dependencies right. And the second one is um, going to run the Odoo tests. Uh, Travis installed nightly. The first thing it does is that it, it does a git clone of, uh, of the corresponding mm -hmm. Odoo branch. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Tries to do it as uh, efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. okay. And then uh, it's going to install it and its runtime dependency. Uh, who's speaking? Mute. OK, sorry, go ahead. Continue. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the dependencies mostly come from Odoo's requirement.txt.file. So at the root of each Odoo branch, there's a requirement.txt that gives the recommended versions by, by Odoo for, for each of the Python library that Odoo needs at uh, runtime. And then uh, it's going to install uh, the add-ons to test as well or as their dependencies. Uh, and for that, uh, there are now two modes available, the OCA mode, uh, which is the one that's in place since uh, many years now. And another, another one with which um, we have been experimenting in some repository in version 13, and uh, that is still new and considered experimental, but we are going to run an experiment to see how it works on version 14 to see uh, if it brings the benefits we expect on a larger scale. So the OCA mode uh, controlled by an unvariable environment, which is the default, MQT uh, equals OCA, that's, that's the default. Basically, it does several things. Uh, the first is to install 
uh, the requirements that txt files from the maintainer quality tools repo because there are some important additional dependency there. Um, and then it looks if there is a requirement that txt in the repository and is going to install that one too. So for, for, for the, the dependent libraries of, of the repository. And then is going to parse the file name OCA dependencies to look for, for dependent repositories. So in the simple case, what you have in that file is a list of uh, OCA repository names. And what it's going to do is that file is it's going to recursively clone each dependent repository, install its requirements.txt, and then add it to the add-ons pass and then do that recursively. So if that repo itself has a requirement that um, an OCA dependencies files, is going to recursively apply the, the same process. And it's uh, setting that up in a very specific order uh, in the add-on pass. So you get, uh, if my memory is correct, you get the repo first, uh, and then uh, and then the dependencies and then uh, the the Odoo, uh repository in the in the other pass. And it does a feature if you need to do a pull request that depends on an unmerged version and uh, on a branch of another repo that is not merged. Like, like a pull request, uh, you can add it to, to OCA dependencies that takes it like this. So you put the repo name with the, the repo uh, URL and, and the branch uh, and the branch name. And uh, yeah, I think maybe I should remove github.com. Yeah, anyway. Um, of course, you don't. You need to not to forget when when merging to to remove those because uh, you can only merge a module when the dependencies are merged. Otherwise, you you're going to make the, the main branch red at at some point. Um, the other one uh, is uh, processing. The other method that that uh, we are going to experiment with in version fourteen is uh, taking a different approach that is uh, more fine-grained. And uh, the, the reason, uh, there are several reasons to that. Um, the, the main reason is that we, we often see uh, that when a repository uh, or when you, have a, when, when you have big repositories, like say server tools, um, there are some modules that are maybe not very often used, but that have very specific dependencies. Uh, and the main problem with the, the, the methods we have now is that all the modules and all the dependencies are always installed uh, or at least made available in the add-ons pass uh, for, for all the tests. And someone, sometimes this can have far-reaching effects um, uh, when you can have a, an obscure module in, in the bottom of server tools that's going to break uh, many repos just because they indirectly depend on server tools uh, and, and creating a lot of noise when, when that happens. So the idea of, of the new method is to put in the add-ons pass only the add-ons that are necessary for uh, testing a given repository. So only the add-ons dependencies and not whole repository uh, dependencies. The other benefit uh, we are seeking with that approach um, is the, that, that requirements.txt file. Uh, currently, the, the requirement.txt files is uh, partly redundant what, with what we, you, you need to have in the add-ons manifest anyway. Um, in an add-on manifest, there is this uh, external dependencies key where you are supposed to declare all dependencies uh, of your add-on uh, so your, your user can, can discover them. And um, there is a risk that both are going to diverge and that requirements when they still will, will not be compatible or will not be the same as what there is in, in the add-ons manifest. So that, that's another main aspect we, we want to, to improve. And so uh, in this case, the installation method is a little bit different. So 
basically it starts from uh, a file named test requirements.txt. And for each add-on in, in the repo is going to add a line in the test requirement.txt, which looks like this minus E with the repository where we have the, the setup.py uh, for, for the add-on. And then we ask pip to do the installation. And basically that's almost every, uh, all we have to do to ask him to install those, this test requirement.txt and asking it to look at the add-ons on the willors.odocommunity.org where we are publishing all merged add-ons uh, anyway. And in that way, the installation process is on, on the one hand much simpler. So we, we simplify uh, maintainer quality tools. And on the other hand, uh, is going to install only the, the, the necessary dependencies and not whole repository. And that means that we should have much less uh, issues uh, where you have one repo uh, with, with trouble that is breaking too many repo. We really need to have one specific add-on that others depend on to have problem to, to break uh, dependent repos. Uh, and so, yeah, the dependencies are then discovered by PIP because they are embedded uh, or at least declared in the wheels that are published on, on our wheel OS. And with this mode, uh, when you, you need to depend on unmerged dependencies, uh, you need to add them in test requirements.txt uh, using this syntax, which is uh, the native syntax of, of uh, PIP to, to reference, uh, um, to reference uh, a GitHub uh, pull request, for instance. Uh, that's a, a GitHub reference to an open pull request. And you can simply use it like that. And with that, it is going to, to take priority on, on the other dependencies and install that specific version of, of the add-on. And then uh, to run, that's, that's the installation part. So we have two modes and we are going to try the new one on version 14. And then um, for running tests, um, after the installation, Travis is doing the following thing uh, and the Travis run test script in, in particular, it creates a test database. Um, is looking at the manifests of the add-on on the repository to determine which add-ons it needs to, to install in the database, but without uh, testing them. For instance, if you have add-on A in repository and add-on B in another repository, it's going to install B without test. And then when that is done and the, the test database is ready, it's going to install um, uh, all the add-ons in the repository uh, with odoo minus e minus uh, test enable. So that means that it's only running tests for the add-ons in the repository, but all the dependent add-ons have been pre-installed in, in the database. Uh, by default, uh, is going to run the tests on all add-ons in the repository, but there are possibilities to, to exclude uh, some add-ons. So if you have add-ons that are not compatible between each other, you can declare to exclude them. You can also include, uh, use an include directive to, to, to create a different job that's going to test uh, specific add-ons individually. And there is also a rarely used unit test option uh, where uh, you can ask it to, to run uh, each, to test each add-on individually. It's good for testing dependencies, but it's, it's very slow. So uh, we generally don't use it. And another important feature of, um, of uh, Travis run test, it is, it does some logic to detect errors in the Odoo log files uh, and to, to report a red build in, in that case. Uh, so those, those are the, the, the main features. There are more. So if you look at the repo template, you will see there are variables in the Travis uh, templates. 
And so if you need, for instance, to install uh, specific dependencies for web website repository, or if some repository needs um, uh, Linux or APT packages to be installed before, uh, there are options to do that. And in that case, the best way to do that is to run copier update uh, and answer the questions uh, it's going to ask you so, so you can uh, do a specific configuration of the, the Travis configuration of any given repo. And then uh, that's for, for Travis and then Runbot. Uh, the OCA runbot, and there will be a presentation by Alexander tomorrow on how to install your own runbot. But the OCA runbot is special in the sense that uh, it's getting its configuration from uh, actually the Travis configuration. So basically, to, to run an instance, runbot is going to build a Docker image uh, from uh, the, the Travis configuration. And for that, he used a, a module called uh, Travis to Docker. And that gives the, the guarantee that uh, normally when a test is green on, uh, on Travis, is going to be green on Runbot because the exact same dependencies will be installed in a Runbot environment. And so since that is in place, uh, we have uh, much less issues about exotic dependencies needing to be installed manually uh, in the runbot. So all that is centralized in, in Travis. And basically, if it works in Travis, it should work on, on runbot. Uh, runbot itself uh, is probably, and the, the OCA configuration for runbot is probably worth a whole talk. And you can look at Alexandra's talk. I think it's uh, tomorrow morning if you're interested in, in more about that. And yeah, try, Runbot is accessible from the pull request for functional people to, to do or order to do manual testing. And while I'm at it, uh, coverage, that's uh, the probably the easiest part of our infrastructure because we use uh, codecov.io. And that's uh, something at the end of the, the Travis script that is uh, extracting the coverage uh, report and sending it to, to CodeCov, which in turn is going to, to analyze it and post coverage comments to, to github.com uh, on the repository. So you can see the effect on the pull request on the, the coverage level and you get links to the CodeCov website to, to analyze coverage in, in more details. OK, so that's it for, for testing. Are there any questions on that part? Let's see. Since not, at least not written. No. OK, so <laughs> let's continue. It seems you are pretty clear, Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK. So let's continue. Then uh, translations. Uh, translation is very important because it enables a, a whole non-technical community to, to contribute translations. Uh, so for that, we are using a web plate since uh, a few years now. And in a nutshell, the, the way it works is uh, like this. Uh, it again starts in Travis. So when something changes, when, when you have a merge, uh, so in that case, it's a push event. Um, when a pull request is merged uh, on, the, on the main branches, um, after the test, uh, Travis is going to run a script named click or do make POT uh, to generate the, the POT files for all the add-ons that are uh, installed 
on, on the test database. Uh, the, the reason, and, and then that POT file is going to be pushed back, uh, committed and, and pushed back to, to, to GitHub. Uh, the reason it is done in Travis is that in Odoo to extra extract a translation template, you really need to, to install the, the add-ons on an Odoo database. There, there is no other way to get a, a complete uh, translation template files. Uh, with other frameworks and languages, uh, normally it's based on static code analysis, but uh, in Odoo, that's not the way it works. And so it's a bit more work and, and more difficult because you, you actually need a, a running Odoo database to be able to exp extract the, the, the POT files. So that's the reason it's done, uh, it's done in Travis. Uh, this means that uh, for, for this arrow to, to work, uh, Travis need to have some credentials to, to give it the right to, to, to do a git push to, to github.com. Uh, and also very important, um, sometimes people uh, notice the, the translation are, are, are not available on, on WebLate or new module or, or Google repo is not available on WebLate. Um, actually the creation of, on, of uh, uh, what we call a component, so basically the creation of an add-on on, on WebLate happens when the, the POT file is av available in the translation directory. And if, if, if the POT file does not appear, the WebLate will, will, will not pick it up. Uh, so uh, that's very important that Travis is correctly configured. So for some repos, sometimes we have seen that uh, the credentials were, were missing, but in, in that case, um, it, it's just not running, so it's silent. So if you think everything is okay, but the, the POT files don't appear, it might be that that's because the, the, the settings of the Travis repository are not correct uh, with, with the credentials. And the other thing is that you need to have a line with make POT equal one, one job with make POT equal one. Uh, and that's the one that's going to, to export uh, the translation after the test. And you typically see, we, we usually, usually you have two jobs in, in simple repositories, one testing on Odoo and one testing on OCB. And usually we put the make POT on the Odoo branch. Uh, so we do that only once and we are sure uh, that uh, we get uh, the, 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 correct, uh, the correct file. Uh, by the way, it's important that, uh, and sometimes there are bugs in Odoo that makes that two subsequent runs of, of the, the same export don't give the same result. And sometimes we have seen loops that uh, when Travis pushed the POT files, then it creates a change that makes Travis to, to run again and then creates a different POT files and then flip-flopping between, between the two. It happens rarely, but it did happen in, in the past. Hopefully those bugs have been fixed now. Uh, so in case you're interested, um, uh, on how the ClickOdoo make, make POT works, uh, I've put the, the link with the, the repository here. And then what we have is that there is a globally configured webhook that triggers WebLate's update. So now we are in this part of the diagram. So there is a webhook that make it so that uh, WebLate is going to pick up the changes in GitHub and download the, uh, or, or actually rebase because WebLate has a local copy of the GitHub repository, is going to rebase. And then um, uh, from the POT file is going to update, uh, to do a merge between the POT file and the PO file. So basically, if there are new translations appearing in, in the, or new terms to translate appearing in the POT files, um, 
Weblet is going to merge them with the existing PO files and then push back the PO files, push, push commit and push back the PO files to, to, to GitHub. So, uh, and that way they are also ready to, to translate, the new terms get ready to translate in, um, in Weblet. And that push uh, to GitHub is done periodically. I think it's every two or four hours. So basically, if you don't see your translation appearing immediately in GitHub, it's normal, just wait a few hours and they, they should not, not appear. If you don't see them by the next day, then uh, raise an issue and we, we can look uh, what, what's happening. But these days, uh, the, the process is fairly stable. <clears throat> And also, it's very important to not modify, if you understand this process, uh, it's important to not modify uh, PO files in, in GitHub because uh, Weblet actually is doing a Git rebase. And if there are conflicts on, on the PO files between what a translator is doing and between what a developer would have done in, in GitHub, you get merge conflicts uh, or rebase conflicts in Weblet. And these need these need to be to be resolved uh, manually, and it happens. And in that case, you you really need the manual intervention by by someone who has uh, admin access to the the local copy of the the repository in Weblate to to resolve the conflict. And those conflicts are generally very hard to resolve. So we we tend to lose translation because we 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 don't have time to do a manual merge resolution. So in that case, we reset uh, the translation there. So we may lose some, some translations in, in that case. Uh, and the last thing, I think I forgot to mention that. Um, actually, there there is also a, a tool, and I add the link. Uh, there is also a tool here that um, that's running on Weblate, and that is actually detecting the new repositories appearing on GitHub, or the new branches or the new add-ons appearing on GitHub to create them. And I, I will add, uh, I need to add that link. That's also an open source component uh, that, uh, that can be used. And all that is uh, extremely modular. So this means that if you, you, you want to de de deploy your own Weblate for your own organization, you can totally reuse the, those uh, those scripts uh, because it's uh, is fully generic. And here I've put a link to the architecture document, uh, so you you will access that where you have more details about this uh, this whole architecture. All right. Questions on translations. No. Seems not. <laughs> Great. So next, um, by the way, I, I intend uh, to keep this presentation as a reference so we can, because so far I, I, I don't think we have had such a, an overview of the whole infrastructure. So. I uh, will we'll try to publish that presentation in a place where it can serve as a reference and where we can update it in the future. So uh, I, I will add more links to, to, to important parts. So that should be a, a good way for people who want to find their way to, to, to find the, the starting points at least. So the next part is the GitHub bot. Uh, so the GitHub bot is um, it's a tool written in Python. Uh, it has its own repo in, in OCA. And that's a bot that under the, yeah, the, the specific OCA processes. And unfortunately, it's a part where we, it's a bit difficult for us to leverage existing bots. Uh, because we have very, very specific features we, we need those, uh, in OCA due to, to the large amount of repositories we have and, um, and the fact that uh, each add-on in the repository is often a, a small project in, in itself. 
So the bot is also listening to GitHub events, mostly pull requests, push and, and comments. And based on those events, it's taking various kinds of actions. It's also doing some uh, scheduled jobs uh, that run on a nightly basis. Uh, the main feature of the bot are the merge commands that all contributor know by now, and I, I come back to it in a moment. Then what the bot does is doing some maintenance of the main branch uh, because, uh, and that happens when you push to the main branch plus a, a nightly process, uh, because sometimes we, well, we, we, we don't, um, Four bit manual merge, uh, although maybe one day we'll do, but uh, at this point, manual merge remain a possibility. Uh, some sometimes people need to do it either because there is a need to merge a red branch uh, for some good or bad reason, or there, uh, there is a bug somewhere. And so, when you have a manual merge, the that maintenance uh, of, the, of the main branch needs to be done. So that includes updating the add-on stable uh, in, in the repo level readme. So in some repos, uh, you have uh, a small table in the readme which shows uh, the available add-ons with their current version and a, and a link uh, with a short description. So that, that's a way also to, to make the, the add-ons more, more discoverable. Uh, it also updates the readme of each add-on uh, from, from the readme fragment with the uh, readme generator that sits in the maintainer tools project. Uh, that uh, generator is, is there mainly to ensure consistency. So all OC add-on have, have the same readme structure so it gave uh, a more uh, uniform look to the, the readme that come from OCA. It also adds important uh, links. Uh, so when you see uh, an OCA add-ons, uh, the readme of an OCA add-ons, for instance, on PyPI, or, uh, and, uh, you, or even in the App Store, I think, of OCA, uh, you get all those links back to, 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 to the repository or the place where you can translate or even uh, to, to run bot. Uh, unfortunately, on the Odoo App Store, uh, all links have been disabled, so there is not very helpful, but uh, uh, from other place, all those links are, are there. It also generates default icons with uh, another generator, and it generates the setup dot pi for for the add-ons for those who install with pi P, uh, with pip um, and that is also done in version 14 with a pre-commit hook so it's also there in pull requests it has a feature to mention maintainers um, mentioning maintainers is actually adding comment with a mention to 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 warn maintainers that there are pull requests concerning one of the add-on they maintain so they, they get a heads up and, and have a chance to 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 review or, or say their word on it and it also done some labeling uh, so it uh, is going to tag green branches with a neat review label and when the branch has, go has received two approvers is tagging them with the approved labels We've seen that doing that uh, helps a little bit, uh, making branch visible. And, uh, and since the fact that adding a label makes it more visible, it helps uh, shortening the, the delay between review and, and merge a little bit. Um, it's also, and then, uh, yeah. The, the important talk about merge comment, uh, that's a really helpful comment because uh, it's going to essentially make sure that uh, after merge, the branch, uh, the, the repository is still green. So that all tests still pass after merge because it often happens that you create a pull request, everything is good, all is green. And then sometimes uh, there, there is some delay between the creation of the branch review and the merge. And 
something may have changed on the, the main branch that makes for a, a red build after merge. And the main feature of the bot is that you can give it a command to merge and then forget about it. And it will take time to merge because you need to rerun all the tests. But if it works, it is going to merge for you. So it's also much easier for, for uh, PSC members and maintainers to, to merge because you, you just merge and forget. And, and if it's red, you get a notification and then you can, can look after it. So the way it works, uh, it first creates a temporary branch uh, of the main branch. Uh, and those branch have a specific name that if you have contributed, you, you recognize it. And then it's going to merge the pull request into that branch. So not directly on the main branch, but on a copy of the main branch. It's pushing that, that branch, that new branch to, be, to GitHub, and then it stops. Uh, it's simply waiting for GitHub status notifications. <clears throat> and when it receives confirmations that all checks are green uh, on that temporary branch, it's going to ignore run bot and, and coverage. That's a configuration. Uh, when everything is green, uh, it checks again that the main branch has not changed. Otherwise, we are back at the first risk is that create a red branch after merge. If it has changed, it starts again. Uh, that can happen if you launch two merge commands at the same time on, on the same repository. So they, will, they will succeed one after the other one, but the second one will restart. So it creates some delays, but you don't need to wait for it. It's automatic. And then when it's okay, it's running the main branch actions to the readme generator and so on. It's bumping the version. Uh, if you ask for OK bot, bot merge patch, for instance, is, it will increase the last digit, and then it's going to to publish uh, to publish the wheel and and do the merge. Uh, so that means you get the wrong version numbers uh, on on the wheel. The, the exact commit of the merge is in the wheel, and then you are sh we are sure that uh, we have. Um, uh, a green a green main branch and, and we can merge. And after that, it says thank you to, to the contributor. So that's a, a fairly, that, that's not a trivial process uh, because you also need to check if a user can merge because in OCA, uh, in OCA uh, a, a user that is declared a maintainer uh, in the manifest of the repository can do the merge itself without having push access to the repository. So it's going to check if uh, the, the, the user that's creating the command is actually allowed to merge. So it cannot be a random person uh, who comment on the repository that, that's going to merge. You need to have either push access to the repository or be declared a maintainer on, on the other. And there are many, many more features uh, possible for the bot. So if you are interested in contributing to that, uh, just go and have a look uh, on, the, on the issue tracker. Uh, there are many possibilities to, to contribute. Okay. Chat is silent, so I don't see questions. We have a very silent audience. <laughs> Studious audience or sleeping audience, we'll never know. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's continue. The Almost the last part is the publishing. So that's also an important part of the OC infrastructure is making sure that the modules uh, that are contributed are visible. Uh, and as easy as possible to install. So, of course, the first way to install it and probably the most popular is to download the repository. But we have also the possibility to, to download the, the modules from the OCA App Store, so from the OCA website. Um, 
And that part of the process is done with uh, a set of modules called interface GitHub that was contributed by Sylvain Legal by then. Uh, and uh, also a set of modules called App Store uh, where those uh, modules are published on the OCA website. And that is uh, a periodic synchronization that happens. Uh, I think it's a nightly process mainly. So there, there is no, no webhook. And from that, we, we can, on the one side, have the statistics on, on this on the module. So we have a representation of the different repos, contributors, numbers of modules, and so on. And then uh, there is a process that makes those uh, available uh, on the slash apps uh, URL on, on the OCA instance. Um, and uh, the other part is the publishing of wheels because that's another service provided to the community uh, and the user is that people can do a pip install of any OCA add-on and uh, that is particularly useful for complex add-ons which have dependencies between different repository so people don't need to worry where uh, in which exact repository uh, the dependency is located we can just do a pip install uh, of the add-on main and uh, all the dependencies be it uh, python libraries or other OCA add-ons are going to be downloaded and installed automatically and automatically inserted in the add-ons path and that is something that is done by the the github bot so as we have seen before when you do an okabot merge uh, the the bot builds the wheel and publishes it to the wheelhouse.autocommunity.org and from there it is synchronized on, on PyPI. And by the way, I've checked, uh, as I said before, there are kind of 8,000 packages that we have published there over time. Not different version, different, because each add-on, of course, are many, many, many different versions because in OCI, when we merge, we actually release. So basically every merge is going to, to, to lead to a new version on, on PyPI. We are not the biggest volume consumer on PyPI, but certainly, certainly in terms of uh, number of packages, we are, we are by far the, the biggest one there. Okay, so that's the publishing process. And then the last one, uh, because we are almost out of time. Um, the last one is Teams and CLA. And there we have an interaction with the Odoo database. Uh, you have seen probably when you do pull request or when you are a new contributor, you're see, seeing a notification that the CLA needs to be signed. Uh, that is a check that is done uh, by uh, a webhook, so we, we also listen to, to pull request events to check if uh, uh, the database says that the contributor has a, a correct CLA uh, in place. And the other part that uh, use the, uses the Odoo database is actually synchronizing the, the teams and, and PSCs. Uh, because when we constitute the PSCs or when we add or remove member, they are declared in the OCA database. You can also see them on the website. Uh, there is a PSC team section on the website where, where you see the, who is member of uh, each PSC. And that is managed in the OCA Odoo instance. And from there, uh, there is a script that updates the, the teams in GitHub so we are sure they are always up to date and the correct persons have the correct rights and the correct permissions uh, in GitHub. Uh, those scripts are still a, a little bit ad hoc and there are initiatives uh, in progress uh, to, to move them to the GitHub bot so we centralize all our uh, uh, interactions with Git in, in in a central place, which is also easier for, for monitoring. And those are the main parts. Uh, I mentioned that we'll all also have a, a Sentry deployment. Sentry is a tool to monitor the, the errors that happens in, in the various tools. So 
with Sentry, we monitor web late, we monitor the we monitor the the, OC, the logs of the OCA instance and the GitHub bot to get warnings when there are uh, when there are exceptions and hopefully get a head start to to unlink them. Um, well, uh, and so that's it for me. Uh, so as, as you can see, there, there is a lot of content and lots of moving parts and a small team to, to maintain all that. So if you want to, to play around with a somewhat complex and interesting architecture, uh, well, don't hesitate to get in touch uh, or to look at the open issues on the various uh, projects. Uh, we certainly can use all the help we, we can get to, to keep that running. So, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> See you late. <laughs> Laps. <laughs> Anyone has any question? No. So either it was too complex to understand or it was so <laughs> crystal clear. <laughs> <laughs> then thank you Stefan uh, thank you all thank anyway you. I stay available on discord so don't exactly think. yeah exactly <laughs> we can keep discussing or asking questions on discord yeah thank you thank you all